I'd also like to say, please use the chat function throughout the course of the event to let us know your thoughts about the FILED and the dunes and the wildlife and coastal conservation generally. Um, if you can put things in the chat function throughout the event, that'd be great. But if you've got a particular question that you'd like our panelists or ourselves to answer, then please put it in the Q&A. What we'll be doing is we'll be collating those through the event and we'll have some time for questions at the end and we'll really do our best to answer any specific questions that you've got. So I think, I think that's everything really. Um, thanks again for coming and I'd like to hand over to my colleagues who are, who are based on the coast. So over to Jess Newman, who's the Community Engagement Officer for the Filed Sand Dunes Project with the Wildlife Trust and Andy Mills, who's the Sand Dunes Ranger for Filed Council. Okay, over to you. Hello, my name's Jess and I'm the Community Engagement Officer for the Filed Sand Dunes Project. And I'm Andy and I'm the Area Conservation Ranger employed by Filed Council but work on the Filed Sand Dunes Project. Uh, we've got a little poll for you, so if you wouldn't mind answering the question, it's just basically, have you ever visited the Filed Sand Dunes before? So you should see a poll now on your screens and if you could just let us know, have you ever visited the Filed Sand Dunes? Maybe you don't know, I never know where I am, but um, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, let us know. Fantastic, it looks like um, most people on, on, this, on this chat have, have visited them before that's great so 50% have 13% uh, are like me and they just don't know where <laughs> they are <laughs> and 34% just dropped down to 33% have said no they haven't so thank you very yeah, much for that yeah. very interesting that's yeah, that's really interesting to know there's some people that have experienced the dunes and others that haven't and we'd biasly recommend to go and visit them soon. Um, I'd like to have the slide, please. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> so tonight we're going to give you a bit of an insight into the world of sand dunes, uh, some of their local background, and, and then we'll talk about where the Foul Sand Dunes project comes in, um, our aims about uh, coastal defence, habitat management and public appreciation. And then we'll go into our successes and progress and highlights, um, how you can get involved um, and maybe the opportunities that we have to offer soon. Um, and then we'll go into some questions. So sand dunes, they are amazing. They form in vast deserts um, on Mars but more importantly on our coastlines. They start from a grain in the sand um, and they're picked up and transported by strong onshore winds um, that's otherwise known as alien transport. Um, and it's the wind speed that gets reduced, sometimes due to an obstruction, due like um, a piece of driftwood or even a vegetated dune, that means the sand gets deposited in that area. Um, and this allows for sand buildup um, over time and it creates an embryo dune. Um, over time, pioneer, pioneer grass species such as marum and lime grass establish the dunes in, in colonies and help to facilitate this sand build up. Um, lime grass is so well adapted to living on the sand dunes that it can actually cope with being inundated with water, um, which means it's often one of the first plants to colonise the embryo dunes. Um, this colonisation of dune grasses, grasses actually creates a positive feedback loop. Um, so further inland where the tide's not necessarily as much of an issue, um, marum grass um, is, um, is where we find, it's where we find marum grass. Um, and marum grass is actually so well adapted to being buried in the sand that its roots can reach 50 feet into the sand searching for the water table. As the marum grass then gets buried, it extends its large root system to further, like, further stabilise the dunes and this cycle of sand deposition um, helps create the generation of dunes to grow them to become perfect habitats.
So, in terms of a habitat, why is it so special? So a lot of the plants and animals have to be uh, highly adapted to the surrounding areas, like Jess mentioned before, the lime grass and the mountain grass. Um, they have to be salt tolerant and drought tolerant, which are also called xerophytes and halophytes. Um, on top of this, sand dunes are really low nutrient habitats. So it means you have to be very not dependent on nutrients, basically. So it's a really great area for wildflowers to grow, especially things like hellebrines and orchids. Uh, which don't really like a lot of competition for things like bramble, which you find in a lot more nutrient-rich soils. Um, we're really dependent on quite a few animals, such as, such as rabbits. So in the past, sand dunes would have been naturally grazed by natural herbivores, large herbivores, such as wild cats and things like that. Obviously, we don't have that option on the dunes anymore, so we're very dependent on rabbits. Rabbits are really good grazers to keep the sward length of the grass low and um, which allows the wildflowers to to basically do really well in the area and um, dunes are really good also for amphibians such as frogs toads and newts so we find them in what we call the dune slacks which are hollows low points in the dunes where the water table is quite high especially in the spring um, and it makes some really good breeding habitats for amphibians and then we're also home to file dunes, especially home to 150 butterfly and moth species, including common blues, graylings, and ruby tiger moths. And we also have a home to uh, reptiles, such as the common lizard, and more recently, the sand lizard. And we'll be talking about that a bit later on. So sand dunes are also important for coastal defense. They're often the first port of defense for many towns and villages, especially where sand dunes are located, and um, they can reduce the effects of wave erosion by 40%, which is quite amazing, really. Um, and with the growing importance of climate change, rising sea level, um, they'll become more and more important over time. The best thing about sand dunes is that they naturally recover. So any storm damage that's caused to them, over time, they really rebuild back up, and sand comes in, vegetation grows back up, and basically it's quite, it's, it's quite cheap to maintain them. Um, and that's one of the main reasons why the Environment, Environment Agency fund us as a project. And lastly, but certainly not least, uh, the dunes are amazing places to relax, enjoy and appreciate the beauty of nature around you. So a bit of background into sand dunes. Um, since 1845, 80% 80 of Lancaster's sand dunes have been lost. Um, and that's why they're being identified as a national priority habitat. Um, so in this figure, you can see Lancashire's coastline and the red hatched area is actually the extent of sand dunes in 1845. And as you can see, they stretch from the North um, Fleetwood near um, the mouth of the wire all the way down to the mouth of the River Ribble. Then the blue areas are actually the extent of sand dunes um, in the area in 2007. So you can really see the depletion in the area of sand dunes and how that can impact on coastal defence. So then we fast forward to 2008 and that's where we came in. Um, we were a pilot, fund, there was pilot funding for the local, um, from the Filed Local Strategic Partnership um, that really kick-started the project. Um, and then we had funding from the Lancashire Environmental Fund and the CETA Trust and Aggregates Levy Council. Um, that funded us from 2009 to 2012. Um, it was then in 2012 we gained six months interim funding from Files and Lancashire County Councils and then luckily in 2012 we received our first five-year funding from the Environment Agency um, which took us to 2017 and we were pleased to have received another um, funding bid to take us to 2022. So in terms of partners, um, we're quite lucky that we've got a few partners within us. We've got Fylde and Blackpool Council, who are the landowners, Lancashire Wildlife Trust, who help us out with the engagement community events. So Jess, uh, uh, Jess makes lots of education work and um, events during the summer to get the kids involved. And then also the Environment Agency is another key partner because obviously they fund the project. So some of you might be asking where the Fylde Sand Dunes project actually is. So it starts in the Stargate area, which is locally known as Stargate, so it's south of Blackpool and it runs all the way down to Lytham. And um, there's a few different sections where it's cut off, such as Fairhaven Lake and Lytham Green. 
um, but we basically cover that area there. Okay, so we have three main aims of the project. Um, firstly, um, um, is to improve the dunes as a coastal defence. And as previously mentioned, the sand dunes are actually a first line of defence in extreme weather events. Um, so we work hard to improve the strength of the dunes and stability, but also the size to make sure that the dunes have the best chance of protecting the surrounding areas when storms or significant high tides occur. A climate change is an ever increasing threat. Um, now is more important time than ever to facilitate and enhance this climate protection. So we use a variety of natural techniques. Um, to do this, we erect um, chestnut paling fences that slows the wind velocity. We bury Christmas trees to promote sand buildup, and we plant the four dunes in the grasses to stabilize and strengthen the sand. Secondly, we um, improve the habitat uh, for wildlife. The sand dunes are not only a rare habitat, um, but they're also home to a lot of rare wildlife. Um, this includes endemic species like the Isle of Man cabbage and the dune hellebree. Um, we regularly conduct conservation work that on the dunes that includes reducing um, invasive species such as the buckthorn, white poplar and Japanese rose. Um, and this is so that the native wildflowers can um, thrive and colonise on the dunes. So since the start of the project, we've actually created and improved 20 new dune slats on the dunes and have reduced the invasive species cover by 40%. And then thirdly, we aim to engage and enthuse the public to build an affinity towards the dunes, whether that's with our amazing free guided walks or one of our beach events to discover the wonders of the mud in, with mud dipping um, or the mini beasts in, on the local nature reserve. Or, um, and we even host beach schools um, to groups wanting to incorporate uh, coastal learning into their uh, curriculum. So over the last five years, we've actually hosted over 200 events um, to nearly 10,000 people. And we have conducted 78 beach schools to a total of 3,000 students. Um, so we really do have a large reach. Um, we are um, creating um, enthusiastic um, affinities towards the coastline. So we do believe that by having this connection to your local area, that you're more, you're more likely to try and protect it and appreciate it. Um, so through our efforts to show you how amazing these dunes are um, and the coastal areas are, um, we hope that you'll join us in looking after them for generations to come. Um, so now we've got a little bit more background information um, and more about where we fit in in the local landscape. Um, it's time for a short break um, and we'll be back um, afterwards to kind of celebrate all the successes that we found through having the dunes. But we've got one task for you before um, before you go away for about five minutes, is we mentioned the sun lizards um, earlier and we'll be definitely diving into them later on, but we want to see how well your sun dune spot, your sun lizard spotting can be. The camouflage is impeccable um, and we've got a couple of images that will be rotating around through the break for five minutes um, and we'll see if you can spot the sun lizards in the images. <laughs> Welcome back. Hello. Did you find that difficult? <laughs> well, I obviously was, but... <laughs> <laughs> there was one really tricky image. Mm. On purpose. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, always good. <laughs> Just let me know when you want me to uh, share the presentation, Jess. Um, I don't know whether we could share the summoned images again, just so we can maybe without the loop, or and then we can show people if they've got them right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I don't know how many of the images people managed to spot the sun lizard. There was a sun lizard in every single image. We do. We promise that. <laughs> yeah. I believe you, but I just <laughs> one of them I just couldn't see. But yeah, one of them is really really tricky. Um, but it is a really really good example of how well camouflaged they are into the sun dunes. Okay. 
so yeah this first one's quite easy it's um right in the middle um i don't know if you can use the mouse to mm. um see it yeah right there um see so, but you can still see how the markings on the backs um the shadow of the uh, grasses um how it camouflages that way um so this is the tricky one um and it's actually the top middle um so where that big green leaf yeah so just there so i don't know if anybody managed to spot that one that is the the hard one <laughs> yeah that's a good one and that's the super easy one <laughs> that that even easy. i can do that <laughs> yeah. but you can see how the colors are so well matched to the sand as well with that as well so. So yeah, welcome back. Um, now it's on to the exciting part where we talk about our successes over the uh, time of the project. Uh, we've picked three of the biggest achievements to date, one of which spans across the whole project lifetime. The other accounts for the last five years, while the last has been a little more recent. Um, we've been working to help widen the dunes, which first and foremost improves our ability to protect from storm surges, but also creates um, a vast areas of new habitat. Um, secondly, we'll be talking about our beloved Christmas trees, which again we use to help create dunes and reduce wind being blown, reduce the sand being blown away from the system. And last but not least, we'll be talking about our sand lizard reintroduction, uh, where we've where our foul dunes have been come home to almost 400 sand lizards, which are the UK's rarest lizard. So we'll be starting off with widening the dunes. So for this, we use chestnut paling fencing, which you can see in that picture. Um, this acts as basically a permeable barrier. Um, as the sand is blown in off the shore, it hits the barrier and the wind reduces its energy and it drops the sand behind it. And over time, this builds up and eventually these fencing um, are completely covered with sand. This can take a little six months really for them to build up and to be totally buried. Um, once we do that, we plant these areas up with lime grass and mallow grass, which help stabilize the sand and help keep that sand behind the fencing. So we tend to do that in 10 meter distances from the last one. Um, in some areas, we've gained 60 meters of dune using this technique of the chest chestnut paling and Christmas trees. Um, and it just works really, really well. Um, there's another example of chestnut paling and the mound grass behind it. And just to show you how quickly the dunes can build, just using these simple techniques, um, we've got here we've got an area called North Beach, which is North Beach Car Park, which we know it as. Um, it's quite well used car park in the summer. It's where the Coast Guard station is if you're local. And here you can see the picture 2005, there's barely any sand or any dunes within the within the front of the car park and now well this is two years ago if you go now it's even more vegetated but two years ago in 2018 you can see here we've gained this is probably roughly about 50 meters of dune here which is planted up christmas trees you can just see the lines of the christmas trees in the image and um, so it works really it works really well um, and not only do we have aerial footage we also have on the ground footage so we take regular photos to see how how it's building up and you can see this on the next couple of pictures so again there, there's the Coast Guard station, so that's just in front of uh, North Beach car park. So just five years ago, there was barely any vegetation there. We just started to do some work. Um, and now, as you can see, uh, we've gained 60 meters in this area. You can just see the tops of the Christmas trees there, the chestnut paling, which will have been there for what, about six months to a year. That's part buried already. And behind the chestnut paling and the Christmas trees, there's Marron grass already growing up, so that helps to stabilize the sand there. Again, it's a bit further down the coast. Again, you can see it really, really working. So the chestnut paling, when it's put in, is about three foot high. So you can see in this image, there's only about 30 centimeters, 40 centimeters left. So it's already buried quite a lot. 
Um, this area was also hit by the storms this year, so this is built up this year. So in the last six months, we've got almost two foot of sand that's come into the area. And again, that's looking back towards North, North Beach Car Park. And um, you can see there the vegetation that's built up just by doing the chestnut paling Christmas trees and planting the areas up. And this all works towards basically providing a really good soft sea defence to protect the towns of Lytham and St Anne's. Um, and again, it's one of the reasons why the Environment Agency fund our project. Hey, um, so next up we've got the Christmas tree planting um, and many of you, especially locals, will probably have heard of our huge Christmas tree campaigns. Um, whether you've been able to join us for the three day volunteering event or you've kindly donated your Christmas tree, you've actually been a huge part of this success. Um, so each year we have old Christmas trees donated. Some are collected if uh, you're local and um, others you can drop them off at various locations across Fylde. And what we do is bury them along the front of the dunes. So on the next slide you can see um, we dig, we dig big um, trenches um, for the Christmas trees to be um, planted into and then buried. Um, um, and our amazing volunteers across the three days help us with this and um, the trees are actually planted so where the angel or the star would go on the tree is pointing towards the sea um, and this is so when the wind gets blown in from uh, the beach uh, it actually acts as like a, a catch or a, um, um, like the branches catch the sand so much better than if it was the other way around um, and you can actually see if you walk along the coast um, the sand actually building up around the Christmas trees and a lot of them will be buried um, well well the ones that were buried were planted this year are um, buried now and this obviously creates a lot of um, June promotion so this is our volunteers and, and the amount of Christmas trees we've been um, uh, donated um, and our conservation group that's led by um, uh, Hillary from File Council um, uh, uses smaller spare trees to plant up some blowouts as well um, in the bigger areas of the dunes where there's a lot of um, wind uh, sand being blown out of the system that can end up on the roads or even in the houses uh, nearby. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, so this was taken from this year's uh, event and we actually um, managed to get 600 metres of Christmas trees along the front of the dunes um, and I've got some of these amazing drone images from drone works and you can really see how um, how much space can be created just through uh, planting the Christmas trees. Um, 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 yeah, and there's those, these trees, you can see how much they've actually built up and um, that's the, this is an image from earlier, but you can see where the uh, uh, fencing has actually been buried as well. So this year's this year our trees were actually hit by Storm Kira and Dennis um, and it wasn't actually long after the um, Christmas tree planting event either um, but it was bittersweet as the line of trees and most of our fencing really took the brunt of the storms. Um, unfortunately a lot got washed away as you can see the, um, the damage that it actually caused um, but on the plus side um, the impact of the storms did not impact the dunes as much as it could have done. Um, so on the next slide um, you can actually see here um, where the tide line has come up to. So on the image on the left, you can see uh, where there's no Christmas trees and how far the tide lines come up. And then on the trees, the pictures on the right, you can see how much of a barrier the trees have actually been to the high tide line. So we're so grateful for the amount of um, volunteers and help that we received um, earlier this year, because um, you can really see how well they've acted as a barrier. Um, so the huge Christmas tree count, um, so it's been running for five years now um, and we've seen over 8,500 Christmas trees buried and planted across the dunes um, with the help of nearly 900 volunteers. So we would love to be inviting you to the event this February um, to join us and plant your own Christmas trees. 
unfortunately at the moment um, this year's plans aren't setting stone um, as nothing has been able to be this year and it probably won't be next year um, but we are still collecting trees um, in hope that we'll be able to plant them at some point um, so there'll be various drop-off locations um, for you to donate your Christmas tree um, but they'll be coming out on social media um, in the coming months so keep an eye out for those on our um, Facebook, Twitter or um, Instagram. And last but not least is the San Lizard V introduction. So it's been a bit of a highlight this year. And um, so over the past three years, we've reintroduced um, San Lizards onto the file dunes. Um, these have been bred by Ray and Paul from the Merseyside and Filed Amphibian and Reptile groups. And they've been released onto the dunes at Filed. And the population of Filed is now the northernmost population in England, which is, which is pretty amazing really. Um, so yeah, it's Natural England, we've worked with Natural England and ARC Trust, which is the Amphibian Reptile Conservation Trust, to get these lizards back on the dunes. They were last seen in the 1960s, but these aren't official records, it's just what local people have said they last saw them. Um, the reason why we've brought them to the file is because of the hard work that we've been doing on widening the dunes and improving the dune habitat has allowed the habitat to be suitable for sound lizard release. So the lizards that we've got here are the Sefton breed. As I said before, Ray and Paul have been breeding those for us and we've been reintroducing them onto the dunes. Um, and it's the perfect habitat for them really. They're well camouflaged, there's lots of insects and beetles for them to eat and they hibernate in the sand each year. So they dig a little hole um, and sort of bury themselves in the sand and it keeps them keeps them alive over winter and then they also lay their eggs in the sand as well so they dig little holes lay their eggs and then they'll leave them until they hatch out so uh, we've already seen real good successes we've already had hatched eggs and um, baby lizards seen things like that so Hillary and the volunteers they go around taking out the invasive species such as sea buckthorn and um, white poplar opening up those areas creating more bare sand, which allows them areas of breeding and basket and hibernating. And there you go, that's what they look like when they come in the box. So a funny thing is, um, we can touch them, we can pick them up out of the box, but as soon as they go onto the sand, we're not allowed to touch them anymore. So they're protected species, so you have to have a license to touch wild lizards. So once they're out of the box on the dunes are classed as wild lizards, which is quite a good fact. So for the final release uh, this year, we were actually lucky enough to have our sand lids make an appearance on BBC. Um, firstly for Northwest Tonight and then the next morning on BBC Breakfast. Um, so for BBC Breakfast interview, we surprisingly had two stragglers of sand lizards from the release the day before. Um, they'd hidden themselves in amongst the paper towels um, in the containers that they were in that they managed to stay warm um, for Ray to surprisingly notice once he'd returned home. Um, but this worked out perfectly for BBC Breakfast um, as we were able to have a live release on television. And I think the next video is just that. <laughs> And he's only uh, a little a baby, isn't he? He's, he's only a week, week old. A week yeah. old. Near him, so yeah. Gosh. So well, so shortly. so does he look? Is this what you'd expect then? Him to sort of take it quite slow. Yes. Yeah. Um, within, it's amazing how quickly they become naturalised. So oh yeah. Look. In five minutes' time, <laughs> you'll be running off. It'll be it'll be doing what they should do, and that's run away from people and, and predators. So it, they become wild animals very very quickly. Well, absolutely. Look at him. He's off now already. So yeah, over the three years, we've released almost 400 sand lizards. Um, each year it's increased. Um, Paul, one of the breeders, he's just created a huge vivarium for them in his back garden. So he, he breeds a lot of them, um, which is it's really great. Um, it's really great of these guys to, to help us on the project. Um, so the first year there were 78 hatchlings re released. In 2019, there was 90. And that year we also saw one small adult male, three small adult females, and amazingly, three hatched eggs were found. So that meant that the, the, the first year's population actually had the time to breed the next year, which was great. And then this year we saw our most, uh, 203 
hapslings were released. Um, Ray and Paul have been out um, surveying the dunes and they've seen seven adult males, six adult females, two sub-adults, three juveniles and five wild bred hapslings. So you can see already it's a great success. We will lose some of them through the winter, either they've not hibernated well enough or they've been predated during the summer when they're out and about. Um, but the fact that they're already breeding and we're seeing adults the next year, it's a great sign that they're, they're doing well and it's a good habitat for them. So it's, it's a really good success story. Okay, so if we've enthused you enough um, and you'd love to become involved within the project, um, we do have a volunteer conservation team that meets on Thursdays. Um, obviously, there's different plans um, every week uh, with the lockdowns and um, uh, restrictions occurring. So the best way to get involved um, is to sign up as a volunteer um, on the Lancashire Wildlife Trust uh, website and mention that you'd love to get involved with the Sand Dunes project on your form and then they'll put you in contact with us and we can keep you on a waiting list or an informing list. Um, we also sometimes when we're allowed to do events um, for engagement you're more than welcome to come and volunteer and help that way and learn more about the coast that way. So we hope you've enjoyed listening to the talk and hearing about the successes that we've had over the years. Um, do keep an eye out on social medias um, to keep an update on how things are going and how the Christmas tree planting events are going ahead. Um, so thank you for listening and if anyone's got any questions or discussion points, please fire away. Thanks Jess and Andy, that was really, really interesting. Thanks so much. Um, we have had uh, a couple of questions. Um, uh, Bev is asking about the Christmas trees and saying are they to stabilise the embryo dunes? Can I take this one Jess? <laughs> yeah sure. <laughs> um, so the Christmas trees are basically there to, to help collect the sand so the windblown sand that comes in it gives them a bit of a barrier that they hit so it's a permeable barrier so some of it gets through some of it doesn't so the sand builds around the Christmas trees creating embryo dunes so eventually, once enough sand's built up around it, usually when the Christmas tree gets buried, we'll then plant it up with lime grass and mountain grass. And then once they start taking, the roots get down, that's when the dunes start to stabilise. Right, great. Thank you very much. I hope that's answered that. We had another question. I know you, uh, you typed in an answer, but I wonder if you could um, just uh, let everybody know, because I'm sure this is a question lots of people will be thinking about. Um, Victoria asks, do we have to be careful when we're walking on the dunes? I know my children like to run up and down them, who doesn't? Um, <laughs> but, can, but can that be damaging? Um, so I wonder if you could answer that, Andy. I know you, you typed in an answer, but I know other people will be wondering about that. Yeah, so the, the, the dunes are fantastic for recreation activities. We have lots of sport clubs coming and using them. And um, in, in a way, um, footfall can be positive in the dunes, so it creates bare areas of sand, which in turn um, are good for sand lizards or common lizards for basking or for hibernating for egg laying. It also allows um, colonising species to come through as well, so it creates a bit more diversity. The one thing that we don't want is huge amounts of footfall, um, trampling on vegetation, especially marron grass, it doesn't do very well with being trampled on. So we gen generally encourage people to keep to the paths that are already there. Um, and if we get too much footfall, um, it can create a lot of erosion, which can end up leading to what we call is a blowout. So this is basically a gully or a valley of bare sand. Um, there's no vegetation there to trap the sand. So the sand just blows straight through the system and we lose it out onto the road and surrounding houses. So over time, we try and vegetate these blowouts and collect the sand and keep them on the system because we don't want to lose it. Right, great. I think there's, that's really helpful. There's a, there's a related question from Diana as well, uh, who says she walks with a pair of crutches and is wondering whether they'd be harmful to the dunes. Um, because obviously walking uh, on them when they're so soft and uneven uh, would be hard, but she says she'd, like, she'd love to see them. Um, but would, would her crutches be damaging them at all? I would have just thought it would make uh, it quite hard to get to them. What do you think? Yeah, it'd be and tricky to walk on the dunes with crutches. Um, um, sorry, Jess, go on. No, no, I was, I was just going to say, um, yeah, the, the, the main dunes, the 
steep dunes will be really hard to walk across but we have obviously the front of the dunes where we are building the embryo dunes is flat and often it's when there's a high tide the it's quite a stable area of sand and you can appreciate the dunes from the seaward side um, and we've also got the LNR which is the local nature reserve which I say is quite a nice area to walk along that can be flat in some places that's got a lot of different dune species um, and wildflowers on it so there's still other ways to enjoy the dunes but I would probably avoid the steep areas in crutches more for yourself than anything else. Right thank you very much I hope that's answered your uh, your question Diana. Now there's a, there's a couple of questions about um, the sand lizards and Stella's asking are do they have any predators apart from humans? Yeah um... So cats are a big problem. Obviously we're an urban, urban dune system, so there's lots of cats about and they'll quite easily catch a sand lizard, um, especially when they're basking and warming up in the morning. Um, kestrels, cat, um, they will eat them. Foxes, if they can catch them. But sand lizards are so hard to, to spot, you'll have to have a really good eye to catch them anyway. So um, even going out and surveying them and monitoring them, nine times out of 10, you probably won't see them. So um, good luck to anything that tries to catch them really. <laughs> We've got quite a lot of questions coming in, so um, we'll try to get around as, to as many as possible. Uh, one that I don't believe has been, been answered yet, I've, I've sort of been typing away various other things in the chat, so do correct mm -hmm. me if it has already been uh, answered. But um, Vinny Holt asks, are, are there any plans to release smooth snakes in the future, or are there any records of them being in the area in the past? Uh, I understand that they can usually be found in the southern coastal dunes where sand lizards are plentiful. Very interesting question. Yeah. That is a good one. Um, I don't, there isn't any plans to. Um, I don't think there will be. Um, it's a tricky one. So it took a long time to get the sand lizards released. It was uh, about six years before we actually had they've granted permission to put them in and it's been three years of introducing them so to do another large-scale reintroduction uh, would be tricky um, I don't know personally if they were ever um, re recorded on the dunes and um, not from what I've seen uh, there's been no snake species recorded in the dunes um, I think the, probably the most likely one would be grass snakes obviously in the dunes slacks on the nature reserve it's a bit more of a suitable habitat for them but I don't think we get to move snakes though Uh, Vinny also asked, was human footfall the main cause for all past erosion or were they dug out for the sand? Um, I suppose if you include human footfall, footfall in the urbanisation of the surrounding areas, um, so with the uh, fragmentation that happened to the sand dunes on the coast, um, it was mainly due to um, what's called as coastal squeeze, so they'll the main impact was due to um, the uh, like basically when Blackpool became more of a town um, with more uh, buildings it's just it just kind of was man-made to um, not have any dunes there um, people wanted to join the coast and not a sand dune and that's how it started off um, but I think the potential for more people enjoying the coast and um, when it became more of a popular destination definitely had an impact on that as well. Yeah, so, so there's certain areas where sand used to be extracted from the dunes yeah. um, back during the war and um, there's a few monuments still there on the, on the nature reserve um, from the war with inscriptions on it from 1944 I think, the second world war. Um, yeah, so there was sand extracted in the past, but that's stopped now. And there used to be an old ponting site. I don't know if you've been there in the in the eighties and seventies and eighties. There was an old ponting site up towards the Stargate end, and um, as there was one entrance and exit into there, people used the same spot to get over the dunes and onto the beach. So that's predominantly where our biggest blowouts are. So it'd be over the period of the ponting site being there, or the tourists coming, people having a holiday, using the same route over and over again. That's what's caused. Quite a lot of the erosion in the area so as that's gone now people are using different 
routes to get onto the dunes and onto the beach, we can start looking after that area a bit more now, planting Christmas trees and planting mammon grass to help chop the sand and keep it in the, within the system. Uh, should we take a, a couple more, a couple more, um, <laughs> and then we will we will finish up. But this this won't be the last you hear from us. Um, if you still do have any burning questions, then do do feel free to to get in touch. Um, but Julie Julie Norman says, if possible, will you do another Bio Blitz in 2021? Really enjoyed it this year. Smiley face. <laughs> Definitely, 100%. Um, yeah, so this year we, we had a two-day bio blitz on the local nature reserve uh, for the finale of our Coastal Nature Challenge and uh, National Marine Week. Um, and yeah, it was really great. We had, I think, over 100 species um, identified over the two days. Um, yeah, it was really enjoyable, actually. Uh, so keep an eye out. There'll definitely be some information on social media. We're all hoping for, uh, for <laughs> more events, aren't we? Definitely. Uh, final question. Joe uh, Hewitt asks, are you planning on collecting Christmas trees again this year? Yes, definitely. Um, we have got a few, the North Beach car park will be the main drop off point if uh, you're wanting to definitely drop off your Christmas trees. Um, and then there'll be a few others dotted around um, Lancashire's coastal areas. Um, but the, all the information will be coming out on our social media channels uh, later this year. So keep an eye out for that. <laughs> very much a, a watch this space. Yes, very much Moment, so. isn't it? <laughs> Brilliant. So I think we will leave it there for questions for now. Um, like I said though, um, this can be an ongoing conversation. It's so lovely to um, have so many questions coming in. Clearly you've all been sort of inspired by, uh, by this talk. Um, on behalf of everyone who has attended the webinar today, I would like to extend a huge thank you to Jessica and to Andy um, for such a fascinating presentation. Uh, I know how nerve wracking it is. Uh, I think it's more nerve wracking to do it online, isn't it? Um, but it was incredible. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, and also as well to, to say, um, I did drop it into the chat, but if you would like to support our work, if you'd like to help make uh, these vital uh, conservation projects, uh, work then you um, can support us by becoming a member. I know that a few people who have attended today are members and so a huge thank you to everyone who is already a part of our family um, but if you would like to consider joining us you can do so for as little as three pounds a month. We also offer a family membership for four pounds a month um, so not only do you get our um, Lancashire Wildlife Trust membership magazines uh, which are called Lapwing so you get those three times a year but you also get a lovely Wildlife Watch magazine four times a year as well so this is great for younger audiences and you get loads of other goodies and so you can either get that for yourself or it might also make a lovely Christmas present if you're really stumped for ideas this year. Uh, so yeah all of that is just completely vital to our work and to ensuring um, that we can all work towards a wilder future and, and live a life where we can all enjoy amazing places like the Wild Sand Dunes. So with that I will say Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do give us a follow. Do keep up with what we're doing. Uh, follow the Fard Sand Dunes on social media. Follow us on social media. And we hope to see you all again very soon. So, good Thanks bye. Thank you us. very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all Thank you. so much. Thank